Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful song, Monique District. We're so happy to have you join us this evening. Good evening, everyone. We praise God for your presence with us. I am very happy to be with you, and I know you are very happy to be with us as well. Now, I forgot last evening to welcome in a special sense and greet the brethren from the Exchange District. Exchange was here last evening. Ella David Price, wherever you are, we want to remember you and thank you for sending that wonderful team to be with us last evening. I wanted to greet Brother Evering, Valen Evering and Sister Salome Evering uh, from that church and also Adriel Evering from that church who has been a pivotal person with us from the beginning, helping us with those three months on exchange. My apologies for not mentioning you in a special way yesterday, last evening. This evening we are happy to have with us the Monique District of Churches. And as I looked on it a while ago, Pastor Codner, I realized that I've passed on all of these districts so far. The, on Sunday night, we had Stettin. I passed at Stettin for about a year. When Pastor Sorbel was a little, the intern, the, the youth director was a little faster. <laughs> and I was there with him for a while. Then on Tuesday, we had Claremont District. I passed at Claremont for a little while. Then last evening, we had Exchange. I passed at Exchange for many years. Then this evening, we have Monique. And I passed at Monique twice for some short periods of time. And what a joy it has been. Very wonderful districts these are. And certainly Monique District. Happy to have the brethren here with us from that district this evening. I'm also happy to have joining us uh, online on Facebook, um, Garfield Archer. Now, Garfield Archer, there are two Garfield Archers that I know very well. One of them is from the Exchange Church. He lives overseas now, I think, but he was baptized at the Exchange Church when I was there. Uh, a deacon of the church, he was head deacon at the time. I'm not talking about you nor Garfield. I'm happy to have you too. <laughs> but there's another Garfield Archer online on Facebook uh, this evening. Uh, a brother of mine, a blood brother of mine who lives in Miami. Garfield, <laughs> greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. And I want to greet your wife as well. And pray that God will certainly you know, come near to all of us and bless all of us in a marked way. Turn to the screen right now. Turn to the screen right now. I'm going to put on the screen... I'm going to ask you to put on the screen the Ministry of Healing, what I have right here, because I want to do the little health nugget just before I begin. So put this on screen for me, please, uh, from the Ministry of Healing. Now remember, I told you these things, the eight great principles of health. Ministry of Healing, page 127. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. We attached these... Uh, letters to them, forming an acronym as it were, but in order to make you, us remember it more easily, we unscramble these to get new start. And for this evening, I want to encourage you to spend much time working on your diet. Remember, remember, we are in COVID times, and you want to make sure that your immune system is strong and robust. One significant way to do that is to ensure that your diet consists primarily of nuts, grains, fruits, and vegetables in variety. Nuts, grains, fruits, and vegetables. And make sure that you arrange your program in such a way that you eat at regular intervals. So set your breakfast for regular times, lunch, regular times, dinner, regular times, etc., 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 so if you're having breakfast seven, one morning, try to have it at that time or very close to that time every morning. So make sure your meals occur at regular intervals and wait until the meal is properly digested before you eat again. So let at least five, six, seven hours, at least five uh, pass before your next meal and don't take even a nut, a peanut in between. And you'll find that you'll feel much better and your health will significantly increase. Thank you so much. A tip, a health tip from your pastor's corner. 
healthy from that corner. Now, this evening, the message is entitled, Seven Days to Heaven. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Eternal Father, we are so grateful this evening for your great love and power to us and for your call upon our lives. As we open your words now with great power, speak to our hearts. Grant that no one will be the same. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I noticed that there was a discussion going on on Facebook a while ago. I checked to see what was happening. And I saw, I don't remember the name now, a member from WhatsApp um, joining. And Ray Preble asking the person if he knows um, Pastor Carter. Pastor Carter is really from WhatsApp. So I not, noticed that discussion there. And Spring Garden District, of which WhatsApp Church is a part, will be with us on Sunday evening. So I'm going to welcome you, Spring Garden and WhatsApp, in advance this evening. Seven days to heaven. Seven days to heaven. Have you ever wondered how you can really find the truth? How can I find the truth? Now, we are going to take a journey of four horsemen in Revelation chapter 6 this evening. I want you to follow me very closely. In Revelation chapter 1, now remember, we looked at the, the conquering land of the tribe of Judah who was worthy to open the book to loose the seals. So we looked at him last evening and this evening, he is opening the seals one by one. So let's go to the first seal. Revelation 6 verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, the four beasts, translated really more properly are creatures, four living creatures, not beasts as in uh, Therion, as in the regular wild beasts, but living creatures more properly translated. And the, the, the message was, come and see. And we are told that this seal, we are told what happened under this seal, and I'm going to show you why this seal applies to the church of God from the, in the apostolic times. Approximately 31 um, AD, uh, 31 AD, 31 to, to 100, 31 to 100 a D. In verse 2, it says, I looked and behold a what? A white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. A crown was given unto him. He went out conquering and to conquer. This image represents the church in its pure original state. And this is the, the church, the pure church of God in the time of the apostles, just after the time of Jesus and this church we are told went forth conquering and to conquer in other words this church was a victorious church it loved the Lord it maintained the purity of Jesus it walked in the way of God the members submitted themselves to Jesus and so we find this church as a victorious church 31 to 100 AD that's seal number one but we come to seal number two so the conquering lion opened now the second seal. Now remember, the intent is to get to, to open the book. To see what is written in the book. But in order to open the book, the seals first had to be opened. So it opens now the second seal. Which we will show you represents God's church from 100 to about approximately 313 A.D. When he opened the seal, what did he see? When he said, come forth, another horse, fiery red, went out. It was granted this horse, this horseman with this horse, granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth that people should do what? Kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So in this period of the church, there would be a lot of persecution tribulation bloodshed that's why the church is shown the horse is shown as coming very red 
And you notice that among the periods here of this church under persecution was it the great 10 year persecution, uh, 313, 3, or 3, or 3 to 313, starting with Emperor, Emperor Diocletian. 10 years of great persecution when thousands and thousands died for no other reason than that they gave their lives to the Lord of heaven and sought to walk in his way. Many were burnt at the stake and they were given opportunity to recant their faith. But they said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Some were thrown into, into as it were, un placed on fields, thrown into dens with lions, wild beasts, torn asunder. But by the grace of God, they maintain their credibility. They maintain their commitment. And you can maintain your credibility, your commitment, your surrender, your Christian experience with Jesus this evening, irrespective of your circumstances. Let me tell you something very special. You may be going through many trials right now. You may find that all sorts of evil forces are against you. As a matter of fact, your life may be in jeopardy. Perhaps you are in a country where Christianity is even outlawed. But by the grace of God, you are standing for Jesus. Stand for him because Jesus will stand for you. And even if you live in a country where Christianity is well established and you are free to worship as you see fit, the raw truth is you are not fully free. Because when you seek to follow God, to the fullest extent, family members, neighbors, friends, very many times turn their backs against you and you are left alone with, from human support. But with Jesus, you are never alone. So we find that this seal, the second seal, represents a, a bloodstained faith. So if we were to use one adjective to describe the horseman or the horse and horseman, Number one, it would be pure. If you would use one adjective to describe the second one, it would be, it would be um, blood-stained. But let's go to number three. 313. Just about the time Constantine was getting baptized, accepting the faith, and so on, to 538. First, the horse was white. Purity. Then the horse was red. Blood stained. Now the horse became black. When he opened the third seal, verse 5, Revelation 6, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. A horse jumped out. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. This signified that God's church at this stage was being weighed in the balances of the sanctuary and was found wanting. So this means the church was not compromising its faith. God had to be assessing, weighing the church, and the church was failing in its assessment. It was doing a test and failing the test. Maybe you may be a part of a church like that. Or your personal experience may be reflective of that. Where right now you are being weighed in the balance of a sanctuary. And when you examine your life, you realize that really you are failing the test. I am happy that Jesus never leaves you alone. And Jesus never leaves alone people where they are. He reaches down where we are. He grasps our hands and he lifts us up. You know? The only place I have seen where Jesus comes into people's lives and the people drop down and fall in dirt and, and they go lower is, is church. So I never, when Jesus comes into people's hearts, he raises them up. He lifts them up. But in some churches, when Jesus comes into the house, they fall on the ground. Not what can be, that can't be right. Jesus does not throw down or fall or allow you. Jesus raises, he uplifts. So even though this was a black horse representing a compromising church, Jesus 
is working to uplift his church. And God wants to uplift your lives right now. So were we to use a word for this third horse and the horseman, it would be the word compromise. Compromising the faith. Let's go to horseman number four. By, by, before we do that, this is where the church really began to lose its bearings. Constantine was baptized. And he wanted to share, to make sure that the pagan worshippers from the pagan religions were satisfied. So they began to meet each other as it were halfway. They introduced idol worship. Images. The church became as it were, the church was becoming like you, the, 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 the state church as it were, or had become. And, and large, spacious, palatial church buildings were built. But inwardly, the church was becoming corrupt. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, if you put this on the screen, the church began to introduce image worship, like this one. Put this on the screen for me. Image worship. And so, what do we find? The image we find of St. Peter, where did it come from? A pagan image of Jupiter, adopted into the church, baptized into Christianity, and called Christian. Even the image of Mary we find is not a Christian, well, it, if it's an image at all, it's not a Christian image. So we find these compromising features and this is where Constantine also began to work to draw the people from paganism and they began to speak of, of the work, the sun worshippers. And this is where worship of the sun became so acknowledged in the church. And the church was moving now from acknowledging the Sabbath of God, the seventh day of the week, to the first day of the week, the day of the sun. This is where all this compromise began. So when John looked, he saw the church represented as a black horse, meaning it was compromising its faith. This is when in Daniel 7.25 we were told that this power would begin to think to change times and laws. It had not actually begun as yet, but the preparation was being made for all of these changes to take place. As a matter of fact, in, the, in Apostolic Creed, we read, O Lord, O Lord Almighty, Thou hast created the world by Jesus Christ and hath appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof. And that is true. The seventh day Sabbath is a memorial of creation. It is, in, it is theoretically in the beliefs of so many congregations or churches. But in practice, these people adopt the first day of the week contrary to the express command of God. Let's look at what the word of God says. When God made the world in six days, whether you want to say six or seven, if you want to count the Sabbath, look what God says. Genesis 2, 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. This is in the very beginning. First week. Sanctified it because in it, he had rested from all his work, which God did what? Created and made. So God gave the seventh day, the Sabbath, as a memorial of creation. But we find the compromise beginning under this phase of the church between 313 and 538, the compromise, and so many false practices, idol worship, Sunday worship, all of these things were introduced. These false practices were introduced, compromising the purity and integrity of the church of God. We come now to seal number four. Now, very interestingly, seal one was a pure horse, white horse, purity. That's the adjective. Seal two, a red horse, a persecution, blood stained. That's the adjective. Seal three, a black horse, compromise. Seal four, a pale horse. This horse is almost like a zombie. Now, zombies don't exist, you know, but if you think of what zombies are supposed to represent, this horse is like a zombie, a ghost horse. Pale horse. 538 to 1798. Why did God describe the horse like this? Revelation 6 and verse 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. 
and Hades or hell followed with him. Now, now the translation can also indicate, in the original, it can indicate two, two sides. That the, the man on the horse was riding, the horse, the one who sat on the horse, was death. And hell was following him, meaning that they were in company. That's, that's one way. But it could also be interpreted that the man on the horse was death, galloping, and that the, that phase of the church was fleeing away, trying to escape hell. So hell, so it was fleeing with hell following in pursuit. Either way you take it, it is not a good picture for the church. So God is calling for his church to make a bold stand for him today. Now, today we find that our church, and when I say our church, no, I'm talking about the, the church in general. I'm talking about the Christian religion. And, you know, for the purposes of my international congregation, let me, let me change that word Christian and say the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ. Christian, today when people say they are Christians, it can mean all sorts of things. We, we hear that we hear that the Western world has Christian countries, Christian nations. But what do the Christian nations do? Vote in their parliaments for, homos for man and man to marry. And women and women to marry. So those are not Christian things. So when we say Christian, I want to, I want to clarify. I don't mean Christian like when we say Christ Western Christian nations. Where we, we, as nations, we all live in hypocrisy. So the Bible says one thing and we, we legislate the opposite. I don't mean like that. I'm talking about the body of Christ that is walking in the way of Jesus. Here we have real difficult times for the church. Compromising times. The Bible says power was given, of God given to them over the fourth part of the earth. To kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, with beasts of the earth. So during this period... Multiple individuals were going to die. The faith was compromising. The faith of the church was basically dead. A dead faith, as it were. This church, 538 to 1798. This was where the church really became linked to the state in a full way. So now you are the church and state united. Now, it is not a good thing when church is too closely allied to state. It's not a good thing. In some countries, we, we, we chase it. In some countries, the church wants to be the church of the state. So I want to know that whenever the government is having programs, they come to us. But it is not a good thing. It is not a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that government programs mustn't come to us. You know. They must come. We want them. If they want to come, praise the Lord. But there must be no condition, no regulation. If they are coming, they are coming for worship under the terms of the church of God. So we can't have government saying they're going to come. But in order to come, you have to do this and do that. I remember I, had a, I hosted a, a, a funeral service for a high level person once. I was a pastor of the church. And you know what the people did? Send messages to me where I can sit and where I can park and where I can't park. So I, so I said, I said, excuse me, no, this is not how it is here. And because high level officials coming, you, you can park there and you must say this and you must say that and your minutes and. <laughs> so. When we accept government functions and programs, they must be accepted based on the Bible principles of God's church yes. and not based on principles of government. Amen. Because apart from that, we are heading to a church-state union which God does not support because that is surely going to lead to persecution. Let me tell you something. If the, if the Seventh-day Adventist church were to become the church of all states right now in the world, it would not be a good thing. You know why? There would be leaders who would come up and say, the seventh day is the Sabbath, force everybody to keep it. And then we would legislate, some people would, and then we would say, eventually some leaders would come and say, we can't just legislate, 
We need to put penalties. So if you don't honor the Sabbath, these are the consequences. God does not want that. Pastor Johnson, when God had Adam and Eve, what did he do? He gave them choice. And, and what, what did God allow Adam to do? He allowed them to choose. He, he went his own way. So, so God is pleased when we are close to everybody. God wants us to work closely with all churches, all nations, all states, all bodies. God wants that on the basis that the principles of God underline all of those. And we ourselves as God's people are not to legislate religion to anybody because God never did. God gave everybody a choice in, in, his, in his instruction of matters and so should we as the people of God. During this period though, though it was a period of great persecution and the church lacked faith, yet many people lived up to their faith. We think of the Bible-believing Waldensians, put this on screen for me, who were in the mountain ranges and even today some, some sites can be found of where they built their houses, their locations, their hideouts, their churches in, in deep rural mountainous areas of caves to escape the wrath of the state. These believed in God. God protected them. So in the dark ages, compromise was heavy. The faith of Jesus was as appeared as though it was going to be lost. These days were termed the dark ages. But just about the 1400s, 1300 up, 13th century up, we began to see some radical changes. Look at these changes. The Walden Seas arose and focused on the Bible, working to interpret it. They carried pages or sections. And as they went out to sell or sent out their children, sections or portions were secretly hidden and given to people to read. They cherished the word of God. Then came people like Huss, emphasizing obedience. Martin Luther, emphasizing grace. Nailing the 95 Thesis on the the doors of the cathedral at Wittenberg and those theses as it were rocked the tiara on the, on the, on the head of, of, of the papacy and still is significant in its outlook and scripture for God's people today. We find John Calvin coming up and emphasizing growth. We find Anabaptists coming up and focusing or refocusing on the important right of baptism. Then there, was, there were the Wesleys who looked at holiness, purity. Then we find the Millers, uh, William Miller in his time focusing on the second coming of Jesus. And today, God's end time church lifts up before the world Christ, his Sabbath, and his commandments. You know, brothers and sisters, God is calling us to take a bold and detailed and very significant stand for him this evening. And wherever you are, in your homes, at your workstations, on the streets, in the corners and lanes, wherever you are, God wants you to take a bold stand for him. Yeah. In every generation, some great truth has been emphasized. And in this generation, God is emphasizing a significant truth. But he is now working to draw all truths and all people together into one body. You notice how the reformers managed their thing? You know, you think of Martin Luther and there was a Lutheran church. They focus on some things. You think of John Calvin, Presbyterian church. We think on John Smith and the Baptist. We look at so many of these reformers. They came up, the Wesleys, the Wesleys, Wesleyan and, and Anglican churches. We think of all of these people. They came up and denominations were formed based on the particular truths emphasized by them. But after these men died, what happened? These men died and the spirit of reformation died with them. So the churches started on a good path but failed to continue. We must remember that the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So, when we come to God's truth, 
We are not to come and stop at one place. But we are to grow in Jesus. Step by step. Becoming more and more like him. In character. And learning more and more of his truth. And abiding by God's truth. By the grace of God. So we find the law of God being emphasized along with the righteousness of Christ in these days. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That's a specific requirement of Jesus for these last days. And Jesus sheds his message abroad. He wants to get the message to all the nations of the world. Black and white. Red and blue. Pink and green. Gray and everything else I throw in those colors because some people are very concerned about the color of Jesus for example so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right up front all the images we have here are images that we have gotten off from um, you know from a digital thing because we do not emphasize color we don't the Adventist church doesn't emphasize color so if you see an image that doesn't resemble you just just in your mind, with the Spirit of God, just refocus the image in your minds and put the color you want, the, the features you want, everything you want, and that is fine because we could put any image up there. We don't know what Jesus looked like. We don't know. So we just took an image. We don't know. So we can put anyone. So just refocus the image according to your best liking and according to the Word of God and you are fine. So Jesus wants to reach all nations. Whatever the, the race, whatever the color, whatever the creed, he wants to read, reach all nations. We come to, to the fifth seal. Very interesting. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. I'm going to ask you to spend some time and read this in your spare time. I won't spend much time with it here. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And it goes on to say, White robes were given unto every one of them. It was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So under this seal, seal five, we find a situation where there is, is an imagery being used. And all of these people have been slain. They have been killed. All of them have been killed. And just as the blood of, of Abel cried from the ground. Doesn't mean Abel was alive. It's a figure of speech. A part of speech. And as, as, as it, it cried from the ground for justice, so the blood of these people were crying for justice as it were. And, and this, this, this figure of, of, of the blood crying for justice received an answer. White robes were given them. In other words, what this is really saying, during the time of the pale horse, not only were the reformers killed, the Christians killed, slain, destroyed, but their reputations were destroyed as well. I say reputations, not characters. Because only God can touch somebody's character. Your reputation, men can change. But only God can touch your character. Reputation is, is how people perceive you. Character is who you are in the sight of God. So here it is. Here it is now. White robes were given them. In other words, even after that time, their reputations began to, to look better. Like, for example, today, Martin Luther was thrown out, despised. John Huss burnt at the stake with Jerome. But today, these men are highly respected. Their work, highly respected. White robes have been given them, as it were, under the seal number six. Seal number seven. Rather, number, number six. Revelation 6, 12 to 14. I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Lo, there was a great, great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs. 
when she shaking off a mighty wind. Look at this. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Let's take a quick look. I'm going to show you some timelines now for these signs. Let, let's go back to the screen. We have the Lisbon earthquake. That great earthquake. Representing the Lisbon earthquake. Now you know some, some people have different views on these things. As a matter of fact, I think it's important for me to say before I proceed that there are many people today who want to bring the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, back into popery. There, there are people who want to bring the Adventist church back into popery, where, where we, we have a, a select group of people who sit down and they tell us what to interpret and what not to interpret. Many of them are called Bible scholars. Let me tell you, let me tell you what they do. They aim. I'm talking about in the Adventist church. There are, there are some others everywhere, but there are some in the Adventist church that they are infiltrators. Some are real infiltrators sent by organizations, doubtless. Some of them are not infiltrators. Some just don't know what they are saying. But whatever the case, it, it's not, it's not, they are not good for the church. So what they do, they constantly attack the Bible. Constantly question the credibility of the Bible. They will tell you of how the Bible was, was written and copied and over and over and over again and give the impression that each time because human beings are involved there are so many errors that we can't understand the Bible and then what is their intent what they're gonna do now we say okay there are so many errors you can't understand it but we as scholars now we can figure it out and understand it and after we figure it out and understand we will tell you what it means that is modern popery away with those things in the Adventist church let the church remain at a place where we stand on the word of God, read it just as it is, interpret it just as it is with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong, education is very important. I myself went to school. As a matter of fact, I did a bachelor's degree and I did other degrees. Very important. But you know, the purpose of this kind of education in religious things is to give us a solid base so we can teach God's truth better. It's not intended for a type of popery and management of people where we give the people the impression that they can't understand the word unless we interpret it something is wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. It is good to have pastors who would have studied backgrounds and contexts and originals. It's good. It adds a whole lot to the word and helps us understand. But if they and where you have them, praise God, use them. Where you have them, work with them, listen to them. But if they are not present, it doesn't stop the Holy Spirit from teaching you directly the word of God. So we don't want, I don't want to see the day when Pope takes a stand in the Adventist church and we are depending on men to tell us how to live. Everybody must tell us, I, for example, I'm preaching now. My duty is to tell you what God's word says. But you are not to follow what I am saying you are to first examine what I'm saying. Determining, determining if it is so. And then on your own accord, you make a decision. That is God's purpose. So let's go back to this timeline of the signs. Lisbon earthquake, 1755. Dark, the sun darkened, May 19, 1780. The same evening, moon became as blood. May, same evening of May 19, 1780. You can do all your research in those things stars of heaven falling november 3rd november 1 1833 heavens depart as a scroll that's the next great event look at the date we believe it will be very soon put that on screen for me please keep that on the screen for us so here we have the lisbon earthquake 1755 in the sixth seal these are listed a great earthquake lisbon reaching across various sections of the world, Europe, Africa, Caribbean Sea, Americas, affected. 90,000 believed dead in Lisbon alone. So many more across the world. Sun darkened, moon becoming as blood, stars of heaven fall, 
all these days. And then the next great event, the heavens departing as a scroll. That is the next event to which we are looking. The heavens departing as a scroll. Revelation 6, 15 to 17 tells us that the great men and the people, big and small, rich and poor, run, run to the rocks and mountains and said, hide us, fall on us and hide us. From the face of him who sits on the throne. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Then comes Revelation chapter 7. Where God in answer to the question. Who can be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? In answer to that question. Revelation 7 outlines those who are sealed. By God's grace. We will look at that number. That 144,000 on Friday evening. You can't afford to miss that Friday evening. Incidentally, you know, I want to remind us that it's very important for us to follow all of these programs in a series. That's why, you know, we, we are really imploring you. I'm personally imploring you to really spend some time. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you, 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 you click on the bell. Make sure you follow us. Make sure you like because it's very important. When I send the link to you, sometimes you miss it. And like this evening, I send the link to, to, to thousands. Literally, each evening. And this evening I was very late. And I didn't get to send it to some people until very late. So I want you to make sure you come on with or without link. So you subscribe, follow, like, with or without link. You can get the contact. Revelation 8 verse 1 has the last seal. I'm going to close with this one. It says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, what happened? There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, in prophecy, a day represents a year. Look at Numbers 14.34. Ezekiel 4.6. Put these on screen for me, please. Numbers 14.34. It speaks to each day applying to a year. Same thing in Ezekiel 4 and verse 6. Thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So a day really in prophecy represents a literal year. But we are told in the account of Genesis 7 that Genesis 7 and 8 that really how we interpret a year is not really how the Bible interprets it. Let's go to the text. Genesis 7 verses 11 and 14 11 and 24 in the 600th year speaking of the flood in the 7th month look at the highlighter section this was when the flood began. The 600th year, the second month, the 17th day of the month. Now I'm going to ask you to follow up on that in your spare time. That's when it began. The, the waters lasted 150 years on the earth. Let's put that on the screen. The waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now look at when the flood ended or the waters abated. Genesis 8, 3 and 4. The waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Now, look at this, look at this very important thing here. The ark rested in the seventh month. Now, remember, the water started the second month. The ark rested in the seventh month. On the 17th day, the water started the second month, 17th day. Now we find... The, the, the ark rests in the seventh month, 17th day. Exactly five months. And we are told that those five months are 150 days. So really, in, in the Bible reckoning, the year is really 360 days. 30 days to a month. So one day, follow this chart now. One day really represents one year. A day has 24 hours. So if a day represents a year, which is the 360 days, how many would 24 hours represent? The full period, 360. If 24 hours represent 360 days, how much would one hour represent? Just divide the 360 by 24. What do you get? 15 days. If one hour represents 15 days, the Bible says there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Half an hour would represent seven and a half days. But, but the Bible says about the space. So 
it may not necessarily exactly be seven and a half, but about seven and a half days. In other words, when the last seal was broken, silence in heaven for seven and a half days. What could cause that silence? Angels are always worshiping God, crying holy, holy, holy. They never sleep. They never rest. Heaven is never quiet. Always full, buzzing with activity. Angels going to and fro, worshiping God. So what does it mean that heaven was silent? Matthew 25, 31 gives us a very clear clue. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, put this on screen for me, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So when Jesus is coming, all the angels are with him. In the sixth seal, we find the heavens departing as a scroll. Jesus is on the verge of coming. In the seventh seal, we find silence in heaven for seven real days. All the angels have left heaven. Where are they? They are en route to earth for you and for me. They have left heaven. Now these angels, I'm sure it will not take them a day to reach here. A moment of time and they're here. So what this means is that God's people, the journey from the time the angels leave heaven to, and get back there, it will be about seven days. Seven days. So our trip, our journey to heaven is going to be about seven days. Silence in heaven. That's what it means. And so when Jesus comes, he calls all the righteous who have died to life. The righteous come to life. They are resurrected. The the, the, the righteous living are translated. The two groups join together with Jesus and we start the seven days journey to heaven. That's going to be one great journey. By the way, what it does mean is that anywhere you take it, that journey, we are going to cover a Sabbath somewhere in space. Think about it. Seven days journey, a marvelous tour with Jesus. And there will be We'll be worshiping with him on the way, conversing with the angels, communing with them, enjoying the bliss of the company of angels. Then at last, after seven days, we will approach the gates of heaven. What a glorious day that will be. Jesus leads the group. And I am in the group, praise God. By the grace of God, you can be in the group. I want to tell you, in, in Denmark, Denmark, who sent that baptismal request for us, I want to let you know that we are working on it to get a pastor right to your door. Right there in Denmark, we have sent the baptismal request. We look forward for you being in that group, that number. When Jesus leaves the throne, all of us are behind, and we approach the gates of heaven. It happened before, but it's going to happen again. When Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, there was great, great excitement at the gates. Angels sung, and this will happen again. After the seven days journey to heaven, there's going to be a great excitement. The choir of humanity is going to sing antiphonally. As we approach the gates of the city, one group will address the keepers, the gates as it were. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be lift up your everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. That's one group will sing that. The other group will, will pretend as though it doesn't know who it is. And that group will say, who is this king of glory? I, 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 I can be in any group, but I, I, I prefer the group. Where, where that says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up your everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. And when the group sings... Sings and says, and says, who is this king of glory? The answer doesn't come right away, but the other group sings back. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Then the other group sings again. Who is this king of glory? Then comes the answer. Because we know the answer to the question. But we like to hear the name. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. 
Seven days that journey will take. What a joy it will be when we approach the gates. Then when Jesus, Jesus will say, Open ye the gates that the righteous nation that keepeth the law of God may enter in. The gates swing open. Jesus goes in and my feet by God's grace will walk on the sea of glass above. That can be your experience by the grace of God. And I challenge you to make it your experience. By God's grace is going to be my experience. I have made up my mind that comes what may. I have made up my mind by God's grace, with God's help, that comes what may. When the saints go marching in, that I want to be in that seven-day journey with the saints of God to wrap with Jesus. To, to be a part of that celestial tour. To be there when Jesus says to the gates, Open, open ye. And, and the saints sweep through the gates, singing on the harps, rejoicing for the salvation of Jesus, and, and, and throwing down all crowns at the feet of Jesus, because, because he is the one worthy of our praise. As we sing our appeal song, make your decision. To be a part of that wonderful, glorious throng when the saints go marching in. When we speak on the 144,000 on Friday evening, remember now there will be no meeting tomorrow evening. When we speak on the 144,000 on Friday evening, we're going to be developing more on this. But take, the, this, take your opportunity now and seal that decision. Click on that decision card. Tell us your names, give us your contacts. Make a decision. Tick what you want. Indicate, send us a text at our numbers on the screen. 876-504-1046 or email us at northjamaicaconference at gmail.com Make a decision for Jesus right now. The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures the grace of God you can be ready start that journey right now if I click on that link start that journey with God's help by sending a text 876 504 1046 send us an email Start your journey with Jesus. 
by God's grace, you can be ready. Your problems can be solved. Your life can change. Your soul can be blessed. Your experience can be uplifting. Come. Come. Begin your journey with Jesus. Have you stood for the right? Can others see Jesus in you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look on? God's grace, you can be ready. Eternal Father, make us ready for Jesus to come. Make us ready to overcome the challenges ahead by your grace. Make us ready to make decisions that are important and necessary for the salvation of our souls. Make us ready to make any commitment required to surrender to Jesus. Make us ready to be a part of that great number when the saints go marching in. Make us ready for Jesus to come. We pray in your holy name. Amen.